Oh, man, super grateful that you're part of the gathering today. Midsummer, July, hot as all get out outside. So, I mean, what? No better place to be, right, than inside, man, together. And uh, how about that new song? Wow. Woo. All right. That's like, that's not one that at the end of it, you're like, woo, go Jesus. All right. Kind of more and more like, whoa, like, wow, man, God, you've called me to a high calling. And uh, so if you're kind of new to our family, like that's, man, that's how we walk. Uh, somebody was talking to me after the la- last gathering. They were like, this is a real talk kind of church. And I was like, yeah, man, life's short. Uh, we don't have time but to talk real. And so, man, the things that we sing, the things that we talk about out of God's word, sometimes they're warm and fuzzy, all right, and they encourage us, and we all, we all excited. And sometimes, man, they put, a, they put a challenge on our life. There's a level of accountability. And so I love the, um, that we sang that today. Now my prayer is that the word also would do the same thing, okay? So if you're ready, say, I'm ready. ready. Awesome. That was almost everybody. I'm going to go with 99.9%. Hey, uh, today we're continuing in our summer series called Summer in the Psalms, where we are walking through some different chapters in the book of Psalms. I'll tell you which one we'll be in today here in just a second. Um, recently, a couple weeks ago, I had the chance to go to the beach uh, with my family. A lot of fun. Nobody's complimented on my tan. A um, little upset about that, but it'll be all right. Um, so, man, we had a lot of fun. We went to um, a set of condominiums with my parents. Um, you know how it is. Parents pay the tab, and then you ride on the back of that. Uh, so that was beautiful. Uh, so we went to uh, the pool at the condominiums where we were one day. It was my wife and my son and I. It was a huge pool. I mean, there's like 100 or so people inside of the pool. And we noticed when we waded to one little section of the pool, um, the music at the pool got like louder and louder. You know, like you have to swim and have music at the same time. Like you can't separate those. But in this section of the pool, the music was like crazy loud, like so loud it was hard to talk to one another because the music that was playing is so loud. Well, look over next to me, and there is a dad. Like he's early 30s, okay, young dude, early 30s with a couple of kids. And he has brought his own speaker. So grateful that he brought his own speaker, because what have we have done without his speaker, right? And he's got like a Bluetooth on wheels, okay? We're not talking a little JBL that you sit on your bathroom counter. Uh-uh, not that one. Like homeboy had mounted this thing on wheels. It's right next, I mean, like on the edge of the pool, like just blaring so everyone in the pool could hear it. Like you could not swim and not hear his music. He was proud of it, all right? And to make it even more fun, this 30-year-old dad was blaring 1990s country music. All right, it was great. I'm talking about he had Tim McGraw on the playlist, Reba on the playlist, all right? And he's controlling this whole thing from his phone. And then to take it up one more notch, as if that's not good enough, he was singing every single word. I'm talking about bro didn't miss a lyric. He clearly grew up in the South. I mean, he is, he's backwards hat, sunglasses, cool dad, all right, throwing the ball with his seven-year-old son. It's like every word of Trisha Yearwood's X's and O's. She used to tie her hair up in ribbons. I'm like, dude, you got no shame. She's an American girl. All right. I'm kidding you. Real as today is. And I'm like, dude, you have zero shame in your playlist, zero shame in your life, really, at all. Like, I aspire to be more like you. But here's the deal. Everybody heard it. Like, everybody knew this guy was at the pool, and that's his jam. Now, why in the world do I tell you that ridiculousness, okay, about my bro that I never met, all right, and I still don't know his name to this day? Because here's what I would say as we start in the Word today. Your life, stay with me, your life is playing and declaring a a playlist, okay? A song is coming out of your life. Whether you realize it or not, like you woke up this morning and it's like just coming out of you. Your spouse could tell you maybe the title track. Your coworkers know the rhythm of what's coming out of your life. And I would just say today as we dive into the word and we let it reflect on us, like what's your jam? What is the song that's coming out of your life right now? Like if somebody says, yeah, man, Jim's my coworker, and here's what I hear Jim's song as right now. Jim may not even know that's his song, but I'm just telling you, when he walks through the office on Monday, that's the song that Jim's life's declaring. And my hope today is that, man, as we spend time in God's Word, as we sing truth about Jesus, that it would just get all over us in such a way and all up in us that, like, God's Word, His truth, would be the loudest song of our life. So that everybody around us just goes, man, like, I know, no, like, no, Ashley, like, she's been with Jesus, and it's just coming out of her life. And so today, man, my hope is that the Word's going to speak into us and call us in that way. Now, I told you we'd be in Psalms. Psalm chapter 40 is where we're going to be. So a race to get there. Ready, set, go. All right, Psalm chapter 40, if you don't have a copy of Scripture, we'll put verses on the screen for us to 
uh, follow along. Man, I'm really excited today. I don't know, you're like, you're excited every week. Like, yeah, I am. I love the word. All right, but I'm really excited today because Psalm chapter 40, particularly the first part of Psalm uh, 40 is, man, it's one of my favorite chunks of scripture in all of the book of Psalms. And so today, David's the writer yet again, and many commentators believe that David wrote this after kind of going through a pretty intense trial. And if you follow along with our weeks of summer in the Psalms, you know, there's a lot of different, like, themes, kind of, if you will, like, all the different Psalms have a different feel. Um, this one's got a lot of them, all in one. Like, there's Thanksgiving, like, not the turkey, but just, like, Thanksgiving, and then there's lament, and then there's also a messianic theme, which means, um, if you look at this, it points to Jesus way before Jesus was on the scene. Like, that's just how good God is. Um, but David writes this, and here's what he writes. Let's pick up verses 1 and 2. We're going to read some chunks of Scripture, then talk about them, go back and read some more. Psalm 40, verse 1 says, I waited patiently for the Lord. And David says, he turned to me, and he heard my cry, and he lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire, and he set my feet on a rock, and he gave me a firm place to stand. The first thing that David states is that he's been waiting on the Lord, okay? And how many of you, like mid-July, 100% humid, how many of you just love waiting? Like you live for waiting, right? Nobody. Nobody, in our, like we hate waiting. In fact, we'll take alternative routes through traffic 15 minutes the wrong way going home from work just so we don't have to wait, okay? Some of you will pay excess fees just to get that thing in the mail faster so that you don't have to wait. We're not a people who love waiting. But David says, I waited patiently for the Lord. In fact, the original language here for waiting actually um, meant that David could have said it this way. Watch this. He says, in waiting, I waited. That double emphasis there, here's what it speaks to. It's saying that David diligently, earnestly, patiently, and perseveringly waited. That was his attitude while he waited. Now, if we rewrote that verse for most of us, we would say, I impatiently waited on the Lord because he took forever. You prayed that prayer before, right? God, where, where are you? David says, no, 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 I'm learning to, in my waiting, I'm waiting on the Lord. And you know what he found? He found the Lord's timing to be perfect, to be just right. In fact, he says that the Lord came through. He says, he heard me in my waiting. And then he goes on, he says, and the Lord turned to me and he heard my cry and he lifted me out of the slimy pit. You know what David's saying? He says, at just the right time, in just the right way, the Lord came through, that he rescued me, he saved me. It says the Lord saved him and pulled him out of the pit. It's how the NIV words it. David describes that place where he was saved from, and he says it was a slimy pit filled with mud and mire. Okay, now for all my Rankin County boys, he didn't get his Silverado stuck mud riding. All right, that's not what David's saying. David is speaking to the spiritual situation of his life. And here's what David realized. He had made a mess of his life. That his life was now filled with mud and mire and sliminess, and he was separated from relationship with God. And he says, from that place, that pit, I cried out. And the Lord heard me. I waited, but he heard me. Now, perhaps the most dangerous misunderstanding of our culture, and listen to me, some of you listening to me right now are thinking about this wrong. And so I want to clarify it on the front end before we go further into Psalm 40. Listen, as David prayed this, all right, David was not praying for God to save him from his situation, all right? Sometimes we can begin to believe the great misunderstanding is that we just need God to save us from our situation. And that prayer sounds like this, oh, God, my marriage is broken and he's such a uh, pain and she's, she doesn't come through, save me from this marriage situation. Or, God, my kids are so wild and rebellious. God, save us from this situation. Or that work thing or that financial struggle. God, save me in that situation. Listen, those are all situational prayers. And can God work in those? Yes, we'll talk about that later. But listen, David in this moment isn't praying for situational salvation. He is praying for salvation from his sin. The pit of his own sin and his own self. And the slimiest muddiest, most miry, if you will, pit of our life is always our sin. The scripture is very clear. It separates us from relationship with God. And from David's pit, he realized, he's like, man, I'm in sin, and I'm all about me, 
God, would you save me here? And I'm waiting. And he says, and the Lord heard me. And the Lord stepped in and he saved me. So here's my question that's going to matter before anything else we talk about today. Greatest question of today. You ready? Like, has God saved you from the pit of your own sin and self? Not, not God, I showed up because I needed you to fix this situation. But God, have you saved me? Have you gotten to the place like David where you're like, man, I look back at my life and good gracious, man, I'm mud and mess and slimy and I can't get out. And you found the Lord. Maybe you had to wait on the Lord, but he stepped in and he saved you. Everyone's spiritual journey, everybody's spiritual journey starts in the pit of sin and self in need of a savior. You know the beautiful part? I get to hear hundreds and hundreds of testimonies. For some people, the Lord saves them when they're young. It's beautiful. They get a long life to live after that many times for the Lord. For some people, um, God saves them when they're much older. I got a friend who came to faith in his 70s. Come on, Jesus. Um, for some people, catch this, for some people, the Lord saves them um, when they are, they are trying to pursue him. Maybe they're connected to church, and they're trying to go to life group and trying to be in the word, and he meets them there, and he shows them his grace, and he saves them. And then I got some stories that I know of where, man, somebody is running as far and as fast from God as they can. And in his sovereignty, he just goes, hold it right there. And he saves them when they're running from him. Listen to me. Every story of salvation is a miraculous story of God's grace. That he saves us at just the right time in just the right way. I love what 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says. Look at it on the screen. It says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And as I read that, I just go, praise the Lord for his patience. So my question for you, okay, that's going to literally set the tone for everything else today, my question is, have you cried out to God for him to save you from a place you could not save yourself, and have you trusted him for salvation in your life. Now, for some of you, um, maybe you show up today and you go, I, I don't know that I'm, I'm there yet. Like, I, I prayed, God, would you bail me out of this thing? But I, I don't know that I know him from saving me from sin and self. Listen, here's my prayer for you that came in that, that God would use Psalm 40, all the rest of the verses, and he just helped you realize, man, like, you, you, you can't be too far from him for him to save you. Like, he'll get down in the pit He'll get you. It's not clean up and then get to him. Like he, he goes into the mess. And I, I want you to hear today, student, mom, dad, like he can save you. But there's a lot of you who go, man, I, I know him as Savior. Like third grade, Bible school, seventh grade, D now. Like I've been walking with Jesus. Now listen, I'm saved, okay? Beautiful, amazing. You know what? Then my prayer is that the rest of Psalm 40 that we're about to talk about, guess what? It's so for you today that these things that we talk about would now be Seeing, there would be visible and tangible fruit that's growing in your life. Okay, that's where we're going to walk today. Psalm 40, verse 3, let's go back to our passage, and we'll start laying these things out. David says this, catch it. He says, he put a new song, talking about God, he saved me, and then he put a new song in my mouth. It's a hymn of praise to our God. Um, many will see, and they will fear the Lord, and they'll put their trust in him. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who does not look to the proud, or to those who turn aside to false gods. Verse 5, many, Lord my God, are the wonders that you've done, the things that you plan for us. None can compare with you. If I was to try to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. All right, now catch this. Here's where we're going. David has been what? He's been saved from the pit. Sin, self, God rescued him. Now here's what we're going to see the rest of Psalm 40 is his response to his salvation. Okay? Or we could say it today, it's the response of the saved. And so today, for all my people who would go, man, Jesus is my Savior. I want to walk in the Jesus way as we sang. Then get you this. We're going to give you, I'm going to just highlight three responses of David. And my hope is that you would kind of cross-examine your life with the word today, and you would go, man, is this really true of me? Okay, is this really true of me? Um, now, I'm going to put a bunch of S's and the points and principles today, kind of doing my best Dr. Seuss impersonation, all right, but it's really just to help you remember it, okay? But all of them are going to be about saved people, saved people from the pit of sin. So here's the first one, write it down, screenshot it, here we go. Saved people, okay, saved people sing and they speak with gratitude. 
All right, I'm just pulling principles right out of what David wrote. Saved people sing and they speak with gratitude. Let's break those two um, verbs down. In verse 3, David says, he wrote, he put, God put a new song in my mouth. Like God put a song in my mouth. One commentator that I read this week, he said, God saved David from the mire and he put him in the choir. <laughs> That's good right there, right? I saved that just for you, just for you, okay? Now listen, here's what I'm saying. Um, I've heard some of you sing. And I'm not necessarily saying that God wants everybody to be in the choir. That's not, don't literally interpret that verse quite like that, okay? Listen, some of you, all right, we're just going to stay out there, okay? But listen, here, here's what I am saying, that when God has saved you from the pit, he's put a song in your heart to your Savior. And you can't deny that. Um, man, it's, it's no secret. Like, I'm not a musician, okay? And you heard my rendition of Trisha Yearwood a while ago. All right, it's not right. I'm, I'm many times not on key. But you know what? Um, as we stand, even as we, man, we sang a while ago, oh, but God, rich in mercy, how you love me. Man, as we stand in these moments together, like 100 people in a room and singing, um, I'm just being as real as I can be with you. Like where my mind goes to is my mind goes back and I reflect on the, it's not fun, but I go back and I reflect on the ugliness and the brokenness of my life, where my heart's been wayward, um, moments where I was, man, really distant from God because of my choices and my sin. And then as we sing those lyrics, the power of that truth, where God takes my mind is he takes it to the place of how far he's brought me and how he's redeemed me and how he's loved me. And listen to me, I'm probably not on key, but I've got a song that I've got to sing. It's got to come out of me. I'd be disobedient for it not to. And so I just ask you, like, sir, ma'am, high school student, like, like, seriously, what about you? Like, real, real talk, not churchy play, but like you. Um, when we sing songs, like we sang a while ago, I, mean, I choose the Jesus way. God, you're rich in mercy. You've loved me. When we sing that, where's your mind? Like, seriously, what are you thinking about? Or when you're riding down the road, maybe you listen to worship music, or you're walking around your house playing on your Alexa while you're cleaning. Like, where, where is your mind? What, what are you really thinking about? Is it just like in this, like, complacent ho-hum place? Um, are you, like, in our gathering going, man, I just wish this part would end so we can get to the preaching or we can go to lunch? Are you checking off all your to-do lists that you've got to get done this afternoon or this week? See, listen, saved people sing with gratitude in their heart. It's just what they do. You ain't got to be a musician, but it's got to come out of you. Save people sing with gratitude in their head and their heart. But look back at verse 5, the end of what we read a while ago. Psalm 40, verse 5 says, Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you've done, the things you plan for us. None can compare with you. Like there's nothing on earth that measures up to you. And, and David says, Were I to speak and to tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. I love this. Like, David's like, man, if I went to lunch with my coworker and I'm trying to talk about how good you are, we ain't got enough time. Like, lunch break has a cap. And, and what David is saying that the gratitude of our song should also spill into the gratitude of our speech. It's not just how we sing on Sunday, but, man, it's how we speak every day. In verse 5, David, he's reflecting on the work and the wonders of God in his life. And he's like, man, there are too many. Man, I praise you. I thank you for that. You know, as I read a, um, that verse this week, I love that verse. It's actually connected to one of our church core values of forgetting for celebrating. Um, as I read that verse this week, I thought of an old, old hymn that we sang um, when I was growing up in church um, called Count Your Many Blessings. Know that one? Hymn 422, all three stanzas, all right? Listen, old song, powerful truth. Remember how the verse goes? It says, when upon life's billows you are tempest tossed when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Count your many blessings, name them one by one, count your blessings, and see what God has done. See, in the life of the saved, like I'm talking about from the pit, and the work of the Lord is too numerous to count. Too much to speak about. And so I wonder, like, application question for this principle. You ready? Like, I wonder, when is the last time, like, you took 
five minutes at your breakfast table as you're spending time with Jesus or on your lunch break or the end of the day. Like you literally took an extra five minutes or ten minutes, and you just started just writing down the work of the Lord in your life. If you haven't done that recently, like I'm just really challenging you, man, I think it would be awesome for you to do that. You know why? Because gratitude changes our perspective to praise. We, we are naturally a greedy and discontent people. Like just naturally, like I woke up that, this, that way this morning, my wife didn't even remind me to. I just, I just woke up discontent and greedy. Give me a little bit more. You know what gratitude does though? It changes our perspective to contentment and joy. So what does saved people do? A lot of us would go, that's me. Okay. They sing and they speak with gratitude. Like it's real inside of them. Listen, I didn't say it's always easy, but I'm just saying it's real because it comes from the overflow of God, you've saved me. Okay. Now let's go back to our passage. Verse 6, Psalm 40, verse 6. David goes on, he says, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, here I am, I've come. It's written about me in the scroll. David says, verse 8, I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. Now, sacrifices, offerings, common practice in the Old Testament, if you've read much of it, okay? Okay. But David's declaring that he realized more important than sacrifices was true commitment from his life. David goes, I'm learning your character, God, and I know you talk about the animals back over there in Leviticus, but I think more than you actually want animal sacrifices, you're worried about the obedience of my heart. You want selfless and obedient servants. Okay? And so here's, here's out of that, here's our second response of the saved. Okay, a lot of S's in this one. It's going to be great. Saved people, they serve and they share. Okay, both verbs matter. Write that down. Saved people, they serve and they share. And you can put little in parentheses, in light of their salvation. Right? Now let's talk about what we're saying there. David realizes God's greatest desire. What does God want most? His obedience. That's what he's after. More than he's after, like his, just his song. He says in verse 8, God, I desire to do your will. My God, your law is within my heart. And as I read some different commentators this week, um, a lot of them believe that David, as he's writing this, he's making reference to the custom of marking a bond servant during this day. Now, some of you may be familiar with that. If not, here's what that means. Um, a, a servant, if you will, would serve their master for an extended required period of time. At the end of that, they had the choice to leave. They're free now. But there would be occasions where the bond servant would serve their amount of time, but they would go, man, my master has loved me, he's protected me, he's provided for me, I, I, I love serving him, and so I will serve you the rest of my life. And typically, customary in that day, the master would then mark the bond servant by piercing their ear with an awl. Okay? Now, watch this. You catch what David said? Here's what David says. He says, God's law is within my heart. What was he saying? He was saying his heart, like that all in the ear of a bondservant, his heart was now pierced. It was marked to say, God, I want to serve you for the rest of my life. Your law is within my heart. Someone who has been saved, pit, sin and self, someone who has been saved should have the natural desire to serve their Savior. Or we could say it this way, saved people serve people. It's just what they do. And so as we apply this to our life, let me just ask you the question for you to consider today. Like, how are you, high school student, single mom, grandparent, how are you right now serving people? If you're saved, how are you serving people with your spiritual gifts and your time and your energy? Um, some of you may not know, maybe kind of new to our spiritual family. There are literally, you ready? There are dozens and dozens of roles that people serve in in our spiritual house to make this family function. Like, like on the average, we are close to 100 different roles every week, okay, every week just to make this moment happen, like right here. How cool is that? Like, you are the recipient right now of almost 100 people this week who said, you know what? I'm saved, so I'll serve. But can I just, like, acknowledge a reality? Did you know that if every saved person in our spiritual family was also a serve person, 
Did you know that we would never have empty rolls of serving in our house? We just wouldn't. You know how many, you know how many weeks out of the year we have empty rolls in our house? Uh, 52 out of 52. Every week. No, I know you see a lot of people with orange lanyards and stuff, but I'm just saying 52 out of 52 weeks, there are empty spots. But I'm just saying they're like in our spiritual family and in, catch this, like um, probably almost all spiritual families across our country, there are, there are saved people okay, who just feel no obligation to be served people. And I'm just telling you what the Word says. The Word says saved people have been gifted with whatever gift is required, First Peter, to be served people. It just, it naturally comes out of them. They can't help but do, it's not out of obligation, but it's out of, oh, he saved me. He came and got me. And now my life is marked as a servant to my Savior. Now, he goes on, Psalm 40, verse 9. Remember, they serve people, but they also, there's another S. I'm going to remind you of it. Psalm 40, verse 9. David says, I proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. And I do not seal my lips, Lord, as you know. Verse 10, I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and of your saving help. I do not conceal your love and your faithfulness from the great assembly. Okay, save people, serve people, but save people also, second S, they share with others. Like it, it naturally comes out of them. Did you catch those two verses, 9 and 10? The verbs or the actions that David spoke, um, there's five of them, I think. Let me give them to you. He says, I proclaim, I do not seal my lips, um, I do not hide, I speak of, and I do not conceal. Like this bro had been rescued and saved from the pit of sin and self, and as a result, he could not keep quiet about the goodness of God. And we can say it this way, saved people can't keep silent. Like it's going to come out of me. You talk to me long enough, it's going to come out of me. I got a uh, fairly new friend in my life, and um, every time, I'm not kidding, every time I'm around this guy, like every time we have a conversation through text or in person, like he's always talking about how good God is. He's, al he's always talking about the work of the Lord in his life. And I'm just being honest with you, okay? Like the first time I met him, I was like, man, you're trying to give me preacher speak just because you know I'm the preacher. All right. And I was like, that, that may be a little much. Like maybe you're a little over-exaggerated. Like that's a little dramatic in your life. I mean, I appreciate it. It's great. Like you'd be saying other things that I don't really agree with. But like I'm really grateful you say that. But that feels like a lot. And then you know what happened? I just hung out with him a little bit more. And you know what I found? It's real. Like, he, he genuinely has not gotten over how good God has brought, have brought him from. He, he, he hadn't gotten over the old life that now Jesus has called him into new life, and it comes out in the way that he speaks. And you know what it did to me? It got all up in my business. Because the Spirit started asking me, well, like, man, do you talk like that? Do people around you know that? David says here, he says, I do not seal my lips, but I speak of your faithfulness and of your saving help. He's like, save people, they don't stay silent. Like, it just comes out in the way that they talk. Save people, I've got to tell somebody. I've heard stories recently as I've just had conversations with people in our own exchange family of people who, man, sharing their faith with, with other guys that they work with, with people who show up to their house just to do work, with people that they go to gym, the gym with, with people that they bump into at restaurants. Save people, it's going to come out. You know, what, you know what I like to say sometimes? Save people, they just don't know any better. Seriously. I mean, in our right, Bible Belt culture, we go, no, you kind of keep that stuff to yourself. I'm just saying David's like, bump that. Like, he's been so good to me, and he brought me from that pit to where I am. Like, it's, it's coming out. You talk to me long enough, and when you squeeze the lemon, you're going to get lemonade. And he says, it's coming out of my life. You may have heard this illustration before. I probably used it. But imagine with me that I had discovered the cure to a terminal illness. Now, thousands and thousands of people are getting this terminal illness, and they're suffering from it, and they're even dying from it. I know the cure to it but I just won't share it. All right. Now, what would you call me? Okay, you probably call me some things we probably can't say. Okay, don't do that. All right. But you know what you would call me, and rightfully so? Selfish. You'd be spot on. All right. You're already ahead of me. 
man, how, how selfish of me to have the cure for people who are losing their life, but I'm just sitting on it because it's personal. And I'm just saying to us today, man, how selfish of us to know the hope of the life to come and the truth of this life, but to go, it's just personal. And David says, I can't keep quiet. It's coming out of me. Saved people share. This is what they do. And I think about it, just who they are. David had been saved and he'd been rescued by the Lord and he couldn't get over it. So just... Real life application, one question for this principle today. You're probably already there. Man, do the, do the people that you, whatever your circles are, that you work with, live with, live around, play with, do hobbies with, do they know that you've been saved by the Lord and like you still haven't gotten over it? Man, like me and John played a round of golf the other day and like good gracious, whole seven, he's already talking about the goodness of the Lord in his life. What do say people do? Well, they, they serve naturally. It's what they do. And they share. It comes out of them. But there's one last chunk that we need to tackle from Psalm 40. It's powerful. Psalm 40, verse 11. Get ready. It's going to take like a hard left turn. Here's what David says. He says, Do not withhold your mercy from me, Lord. May your love and faithfulness always protect me. For troubles without number, they surround me. My sins have overtaken me, and I cannot see. He says, my sins, they are more than the hairs on my head, and my heart fails within me. Verse 13, be pleased to save me, Lord. Come quickly, Lord, to help me. And may all who want to take my life be put to shame and confusion, and may all who desire my ruin, may they be turned back in disgrace. Now, I told you, like, David's way up here, like, right, first 10 verses, and then it's like, whoa, what happened to you, bro? Like, bad day, Okay. It takes a hard left turn. He's praising the Lord. He's thanking the Lord for his goodness. And now he's pleading with God. He's like, hey, would you save me again? Would you spare my life? All right. And let me just add a little principle here. Just because you're saved doesn't mean your life is free from all the troubles of this world. Okay. Don't hear me paint it a different way today. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. But David realizes that he still battled spiritual and worldly enemies. But here's what became true of his life. He gives us a clinic on this. You ready? David did this. Saved people stay dependent on God. Saved people stay dependent on God. Key word, stay. They stay dependent on the Lord. Let's be clear. At the beginning of verse, or Psalm 40, all right? I clarified at the beginning. I'm going to re-clarify here. The beginning of Psalm 40, what was David praising God for? for saving him from the pit of his sins. Okay? Here, David is praying for a situational saving or help or rescue. Okay? If you read much of David's life, David faced many earthly enemies and opposition. Like you read much of Psalm 40, and you're like, David, like you make everybody mad? Like everybody's after you, bro. What'd you do? Okay? David had many people who stood in opposition to him, and David here, he prays for God's deliverance in the situation that he's currently facing. He, he models that. But did you see there was, there was a verse in there? felt a little weird as I read it this week. Even in the face of his situation, you know what he also still has an awareness of? His own sin. Where he's still not fully right. And this is how the message translation, I'm going to read it this way, speaks verses 11 and 12. You can see it on the screen. David says, Your love and your truth are all that keeps me together. When troubles ganged up on me, a mob of sins passed, counting. I was so swamped by guilt, I couldn't see my way clear. He's talking about his sin. More guilt in my heart than hair on my head. So heavy the guilt that my heart gave out. You ever been there before? Like, man, where the, the guilt in your life, the shame, it was so heavy. It literally felt like a real physical weight. Can I just remind us today that, e listen, even as saved people, sin is still a real struggle. Okay? We are not in redeemed bodies. These are still jacked up and broken. And also, if you're in Christ, if you've been saved, you also have the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know what part of the Holy Spirit does? He convicts you of sin. Okay? Not always fun, but a good and right thing. And so David says, I know what that's like. I know what that's like to feel 
the guilt of still my own sin that I'm fighting with. And you know what he says it did to him? It kept him humble and dependent on the Lord. He looked for the silver lining in it. What's God doing in it? David stayed, keyword stayed, dependent on God for the power over sin. Um, the men's life group that I'm a part of, we were having a discussion a few weeks ago just about, out of the word, about awareness of our own sin. And uh, the conversation went something like this. We said, hey, there's, hopefully there's a place that you get to in your spiritual maturity or your faith um, where maybe your biggest struggles, your biggest fights, temptation-wise, are not like the, the big cultural sins, okay? Keyword quotations, big cultural sins, like uh, man, drunkenness or drugs or sexual immorality, whatever your other top big five are, okay? But watch this. But as you grow with Jesus, as you stay dependent on him and you walk closer and closer with him, then he begins to expose those under the surface things that may not be as visible or as tangible, but things like bitterness and jealousy and selfishness and pride that, listen to me, are just as toxic and just as sinful is what our world wants to label those big cultural sins are. But do you know that the, you know the only way that you realize these is when you stay dependent on the Lord? You want to know the only way that you overcome those? You stay dependent on the Lord. That the same God who saved me at seven, now at 37, is exposing the bitterness that's been in my heart for five years, and God, I'm trusting that you expose that and you will save me from that. David knew that saved people, they stay, they don't leave, they stay dependent on the Lord daily in their life. Psalm 40, verse 15, the last three verses of the chapter, here's what David writes. He says, May those who say to me, Aha, aha, may they be appalled, at their own shame. He's like, there's people who are coming after me. They're calling me out. And God, here, I'm, I'm petitioning that you would work in their life. Verse 16, he says, but may all who would seek you actually rejoice and they'd be glad in you. And when those who long for your saving help always say the Lord is great. Verse 17, look at how he lands it. But as for me, I'm poor and I'm needy. And may the Lord think of me. You're my help and you're my deliverer. You are my God, so do not delay. Now, David faced earthly opposition, but in the midst of that, did you catch it? He stayed dependent on the Lord to help him as he faced opposition or enemies, however you want to label it. David, David didn't take the handling of his critics or the retaliation towards his critics on his own shoulders but he trusted that to the Lord. He lived dependent on him. And maybe this is just for one person, but Spirit tells me to say it, so we're going to say it. Listen to me. The Lord doesn't need your help in bringing retaliation towards whoever did you wrong, hurt you, bit it, whatever. He don't need your help. He's got it in his time. And it may not be fast enough or the way you want it, but listen to me, he, and he's just. You know what he needs from you? Not helping the retaliation or the justice. Do you know what he needs from you? Stay dependent on him. You just keep walking with him. You trust him. The same God who saved you is the same God you keep leaning in on and staying with. And I want you to see, I read it a second ago, verse 17, how David ends the chapter. I'm just going to read it to you. Here's what David says in the NIV. He says, but as for me, I am poor and I'm needy. May the Lord think of me. Now listen, don't get this wrong. David is still very much filled with joy because of the salvation that he experienced. That God saved him from the pit. But do you know what he never lost? He never lost sight of where he started. He never lost, he says, I am poor and I'm needy. David remembered all the way back to verse 1. He remembered the pit. He remembered the mud and the mire and the sliminess. And he remembered that the Lord saved him out of that when there was no way out. And he never forgot the depravity of his heart without God. 
And because of that, you know what it daily, you know what it caused him to keep doing? Keep staying dependent on the Lord over and over. Um, this week, I read a quote in a uh, little devotional I'm doing with some guys that I'm walking with. And there's a quote this week, and man, as I was thinking about Psalm 40, like it just jumped out in my face. So I'm going to just share with you what I read. Here's what the quote said. It said, if we wake up and remind ourselves of the gospel, that we've been saved, if we remind ourselves of the gospel each day, we will live in grateful joy that the toughest battle we are going to face today has already been won. David knew the Lord. He knew God. Um, David had been saved by the Lord, no doubt. But David stayed continually dependent on the Lord all the days of his life. So my question is just like, what about you? Like seriously, what about you? Have you been saved by the Lord? Not from your situation, but have you been saved by the Lord where he rescued you from the pit of your own sin and self? Has that really happened in your life? And a lot of you would go, yeah, 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 seventh grade, awesome, fantastic then these things, listen, should be increasingly true in your life. Not decreasingly or just ho-hum or just still doing it the same way I've always done. No, they should be increasingly true in your life. That save people, what do they do? Save people, they sing and they speak with gratitude. Man, it just comes out of them. Is that you? Save people, um, they serve and they share. So, Literally, like how are you using your spiritual gifts and your time and energy and efforts that God's given to you? How are you using that to serve others? Um, who are you sharing with? Who in your life right now is like, man, every time I talk to that guy, he's speaking of the Lord's goodness, and man, I'm just feeling like maybe God's wanting me to know the same God that he knows. And you know what saved people do? They stay dependent on the Lord all the days of their life. So my question would be, like, are you, have you grown comfortable or really self-sufficient in your faith? Or are you living daily dependent on him? No matter where you may be in life or in your faith journey, we pray today's time pointed your heart to what is true and gave you hope to hold on to. We want you to know that we are available and ready to pray for and encourage you as you learn what it means to get life in Jesus and give life to others as you live out your faith. To get a conversation started with one of our ministry team members, you can send us a private message or text your first name to 601-397-6111. We would love to pray for you and walk you through anything that you may be experiencing. You can find reading plans and other resources to help you take the next step in your faith on our website, www.theexchange.cc. As we close out our time today and prepare to scatter as a church, let us speak out our declaration together. We believe the great exchange took place when Jesus, who had no sin, became sin for us so we could know God. We exist to see people exchange their old life for new life in Christ and live out their purpose. Christ's love compels us to exchange ideas for truth. God's word is our standard. Selfishness for serving, we will serve others. Pleasing for reaching, we will share our faith. Keeping for dispersing, we will make disciples. Forgetting, for celebrating, we will praise God. We are the church.